opportunity to come together again and, and look at the book of Hebrews as we look at it rightly divided, understanding who, is, who it's written to, and as the writer of Hebrews just lays out the, these fundamental issues about, about who Jesus Christ is and how it relates to that little flock. Uh, we do thank you for your love and for your grace and for that, the heart of understanding that you give us. In your name, amen. Amen. Okay, so my goal hopefully would be to finish Hebrews 1. I, there's one thing I want to do in the middle so that we may prevent us from doing that. But um, we're, we're really just, the writer of Hebrews, he's just laying down the groundwork for the rest of the book about who Jesus Christ is. And then when we get to chapter 2, we're going to see immediately, okay, in light of that, he's going to have some things to say, and then the rest of the book follows follows accordingly. Um, but let's pick it up in Hebrews 1 and verse 4. I kind of forget where we left off last week, so we'll have to figure it out. Hebrews 1 verse 4, speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ, he says, Being made so much better than the angels, as he hath my inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they, for unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And again I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And again when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he saith, Let all the angels of God worship him. And of, of the angels he saith, Who maketh his angels spirits, and his ministers a flame of fire. But unto the Son he saith, Thy throne, O God, is for ever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is a scepter of thy kingdom. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. And thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thine hands. They shall perish, but thou remainest. They shall, and they all shall wax, and they all shall wax old as doth a garment, and as a vesture shalt thou fold them up, and they shall be changed. But thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. But to which of the angels said he at any time, Sit on my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool? Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? So I think last time we ended up in verse 6, looking at the issue of let all the angels of God worship him. Is that correct? We went over to Psalm 97. Does that sound familiar? Yeah, I think. Yeah, okay. Yeah, it seems like we were up there. I mean, I could have easily checked, but apparently I wasn't going to do that. So we've seen the issues he's laid out that he's speaking to the to the this nation the little flock uh, in time past he did it by the by the prophets now he's doing it by the Lord Jesus Christ or he has done it by the Lord Jesus Christ the things that he said were confirmed to them by the apostles we've seen that um, and now he's going to start to lay out that Jesus Christ is better than the better than the angels mm -hmm. he's he if you go back by an inheritance in verse four he obtained a more excellent name than they right. and then he's going to go out and do that you know for which of the angels said any time thou art my son this day have i begotten thee right he didn't say that to any of them right right and again i will be to him a father he shall be to me a son we went back last and you see there that issue of inherited sonship of course he was called his son back in matthew 3 but also there's this issue here we're talking about the resurrection that that inherited sonship and that inherited greater name because of what he went through. And now we need to remember too, Jesus Christ is God. Yes. We're talking about him in, 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 with the perspective to look at him right now is through his humanity. It's not that God the Father told God the, told God the Son, you have a better name than the angels. Okay, we, we, we see that he made man a little lower than the angels. Jesus Christ came as a form of a man and now that man has a name that's better than the angels because of his, his obedience. So we'll be clear of that. Um, and I, I wanted to tell people on. I muted everybody on Zoom, but if somebody has a question, just unmute yourself and ask the question. But so we'll go back over to, to verse seven. Then he says, "And of the angels, he saith, who maketh his angels spirits and ministers a flame of fire. He maketh his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire." Look over at Psalm 104.4. And you may as well put a book in the, uh, a mark in the book of Psalm because we will be in and out all night. Psalm 104, number 4.
And we'll actually start in verse 1. Bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord my God. And, and just as a point of clarification, when you see that word Lord and they're all capitalized, mm -hmm. that's referring to Jehovah. So, bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord my God, thou art very great. Thou art clothed with honor and majesty, who coverest thyself with light as with a garment. We've seen that, right? That issue of he, he's covered with light, the light of the rainbow. Okay. We've talked about that in, in relation to Adam and Eve as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. Who stretches out the heavens like a curtain. Have you ever heard somebody say science will tell you that the universe is expanding? You, the universe is expanding. Okay, science will tell you that the universe is expanding. Things are getting further and further and further away. What's that say? He stretches out the heavens like what? A curtain. A curtain. When you pull it down, it's just expanding and expanding and expanding and expanding, isn't it? It's very, yeah. very interesting. Yeah. Who layeth the beams of his chambers in the waters. Right. There are beams in the ocean and over by in the promised land where the city of Jerusalem is going to come down and sit yeah. on those beams. That is clearly how I take it. I take that to be literal beams yeah. that are in there in the sea. that New Jerusalem will sit on who maketh clouds his chariot who walketh upon the winds of the wing who maketh his angel spirits his ministers of flaming fire Same reference. who laid the foundations of the earth that it should not be removed forever thou cover us with the deep as with the garment the waters stood above the mountains at thy rebuke they fled at the voice of thy thunder thy hasted away you see now he, the, he, there's a little reference here to the flood and now he's, the, those, those waters are going away. They go up by the mountains. They go down by the valleys unto the place which thou hast founded for them. Thou hast set a bound that they may not pass over, and they turn not again to cover the earth. He sends the springs into the valleys which run among, among the hills. They give drink to every beast of the field. The wild asses quench their thirst. And he goes on. What I want you to see here is when he when he, we pull that that back in Hebrews when he says to the angel of the angels he saith who maketh his angel spirits and his ministers a flame of fire that's in the context of Psalm 104 that's about creation who who was which member of the Godhead did the creation do you guys know it was Jesus right it was the word he he spoke God the Father gave that responsibility if we can put it in human terms to God the Son and God the Son did the creating the angels are people that he created right this is a quote of a passage that tells you these wonderful things about creation. There's more about creation in those verses we just read, and if you were to continue to read the rest of the psalm, then you find in Genesis, as far as the details. It tells you how he did it. So he's saying, you got to keep in mind, the angels, they're created. Right. Jesus is better than them. Okay, and then you go into verse 8, and what do you see? So he tells the angels they're created. He's, he's listing all these things about creation, and in the, in the thing of creation is what? The angels. But unto the Son, he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is a scepter of thy kingdom. Verse 7, he told the angels are part of creation. In verse 8, what did he say to the Son? What, very important. What did, he, what did God the Father call the Son? God. 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 God the Father thinks that the Son is God. Yeah. Now, I, I hope that in, in this room that doesn't need to be explained, but that's that's a big deal. That you have you have the, there you have the, the testimony of, of the inspired word of God that God is saying that the Son is God. I wonder if the New World Translation will go on with that. Uh, well, we we can take a look because I, I I think I did look into it. When we're done, let, let, let's take a look at that. Um, the New World Translation, because I did go look, and it, it they do change a bunch of those things. Um, and when we brought up last time, I think we talked about the Jehovah's Witness or the Mormons that, that think that say Lucifer and Jesus were brothers. Lucifer you know, oh, wow. is an angel, I and mean, he's a cherub. You know, you can have the discussion whether or not that's an angel or not. But he didn't say he doesn't call God the Father doesn't call anybody's son, except Jesus Christ, and. 
And, and, it, and it's important to, not to miss because what the Hebrew, the writer of Hebrews is saying, he's starting to lay out why we listen to Jesus. When, when I say we, I mean, I don't mean us specifically today. We're talking about the little flock. We listen to Jesus through the Apostle Paul. Um, but he's laying out because angels have always ministered to the nation. The, angel, the, the angels are, are always the, the, the ones that have brought the information. But, but now it's going to be the apostles through hearing what the Lord Jesus Christ has said. And he says unto the Son, Thou throne, O God. There, there's a testimony in the, in the Bible, and there's many of them, where the testimony is that Jesus Christ is in fact God. you got three members of the Godhead. They're three distinct entities. I don't, I don't know, or beings, or whatever word you want to put on it. But there's one essence. One God. One God. God the Father, God the Son, and God the, God the Holy Spirit. Now, people will do really weird things with that teaching. They'll say, well, okay, in the Old Testament, it was God the Father. In Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, it was God, God the Son. And in uh, you know, the rest of the New Testament, it's God the Holy Spirit. The only problem with that is what? Well, there's a lot of problems with it. They all show up in some verses. In Matthew 3, they're all there. Yeah. Right? Jesus just gets baptized. Yeah. There's a voice from heaven... The Holy Spirit descends like a dove. All three of them are in three ge different geographic locations at the exact same time. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Come with me, if you would, also to 1 John. First John five and verse seven. And the new versions do all kinds of crazy things with this verse. In fact, I think some actually take it out. John five verse seven. For there are three that bear record in heaven the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And there are three that bear witness in the earth, the spirit and the water and blood. These three agree, agree in one. Do you see in verse 7? There are three that bear record. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. They're all capitalized there. So they're, they're, they're three distinct, but they're also one. Okay? So that's where we come up, you know. Oh, you know, there's no such thing as a trinity because the word trinity is not in the Bible. Okay. If, if that's your best argument, that the word's not in the Bible, that's a pretty weak argument. There's the trinity explained really right there in, in one verse. So, he, he, he's starting to lay, back in Hebrews now, the writer of Hebrews is laying out this issue. God has called the Son God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And now, he's also said that he has a throne. Mm -hmm. And that throne's going to last forever and ever. Yeah. And his scepter is going to be a scepter of righteousness. Mm -hmm. The scepter that represents that kingdom is righteousness. That kingdom will be defined by righteousness. Did you get that looked up? I do, yeah. The New World Translation says, and this is uh, Hebrews 1 8, but about the Son, he says, God is your throne forever and ever, and the scepter of your kingdom is the scepter of uprightness. What? Let me see it's that. It's totally different. <laughs> it totally, it's just one. It's right there. Now, who uses New World Translation? Is that Jehovah's Witness? Jehovah's Witness? Verse 8, okay. About the Son. Yeah. But unto the Son is what it Yeah, says. this is about the Son. Here it says God is speaking to Jesus. Yeah. To the Son. He says, God is your throne forever. No, 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 no. Thy throne, O God. Thy throne, O God, is forever. Yeah. God the Father is telling the Son that his throne, Jesus' throne, is forever. And he calls Jesus God. God. Yep. We're going to look at a lot of verses on this. Come with me, if you would, uh, to... Uh, Psalm 45. This is one of those things, too, where you say, well, why do you spend so much time on this? Well, I, because, it's, because it's there. The writer of Hebrews thought it was important to point out. So when we come to Psalm 45... 
and, and, and you're going to notice, I'm going to read a lot of these Psalms, not just the two the verses we're after. But if you want to make a note, in fact, if you'll see Psalm 45, it says, To the chief music musician upon Shoshanim, for the sons of Korah, Meshil, a song of loves. You see that word, a song of loves? Where do you hear a song of loves? Song of songs? No, but but, but no. today, where would you hear? Where, where where do you consistently hear songs of love? In music, in weddings. At what event? Weddings. At weddings. Okay. Oh. Psalm forty-five is about the marriage of the king. Oh. So if you keep that in your mind as as you read through it, so we'll start in verse one. My heart is indicting a good matter. I speak of the things which I have made touching the king. My tongue is the pen of a ready writer. Thou art fairer than the children of men. Grace is poured into thy lips, therefore God hath blessed thee forever. Gird thy sword upon thy thigh, O most mighty, with thy glory and thy majesty. And in thy majesty ride prosperously, because of truth and meekness and righteousness. And thy right hand shall teach thee terrible things. Thine arrows are sharp in the heart of the king's enemies, whereby the people fall under thee. Thy throne, O God, is for an ever and ever. The scepter of thy kingdom is a right scepter. Thou lovest righteousness and hatest wickedness. Therefore God, thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. That's verse 9 in Hebrews. All thy garments smell of myrrh and aloes and cassia out of the ivory palaces whereby they have made thee glad. His garments, they smell good. Right? He's all dressed up. King's daughters were among the honorable woman. Upon thy right hand did stand the queen in gold of Ophir. Hearken, O daughter, and consider, and incline thine ear. Forget also thine own people and thy father's house. So shall the king greatly desire thy beauty, for he is thy lord, and worship thou him. The daughter of Tyre shall be there with a gift. Even the rich among the people shall entreat thy favor. The king's daughter is all glorious within. Her clothing is of wrought gold. She shall be brought unto the king in raiment of needlework. The virgins, her companions that follow her, shall be brought unto thee. With gladness and rejoicing, shall they be brought. They shall enter into the king's palace. Instead of thy father shall be thy children, whom thou mayest make princes in all the earth. I will make thy name to be remembered in all generations. Therefore shall the people praise thee forever and ever. So you see that that's, that's the marriage of the king there. Marrying the Lord to that little flock, to the nation of Israel. That's the marriage. But I want you to see though, and again, don't forget, the writer of Hebrews quotes these. He's not expecting yeah. them to go back and pull these two verses. He's going back and saying, okay, go read about the marriage of the king. Think about some of the things that they can then expect. First of all, they come to understand Psalm 45 is about the Lord Jesus Christ. It's about their Messiah. Mm -hmm. That's the first thing. Okay, now they figured out that the garments, they're, they're going to they're gonna smell new. Mm -hmm. It's a time of refreshing. Remember we talked about the times of refreshing? He says... Uh, with gladness and rejoicing shall be brought. You see the happiness that's going to return to the nation when that marriage happens. What he's saying is he's pointing out that kingdom that you can expect that's forever, that the king is, that Psalm 45 says God's going to sit on, that the God there is the son whose kingdom is forever. You see how the writer of Hebrews is starting to, to, to point them to who Jesus is, to who their Messiah is, and what it's going to mean for them. Back in, back in Hebrews now. Um, actually, go ahead and, and stay there. Look at Psalm 145. Verse um, 8. The Lord is gracious, full of compassion, slow to anger, and of great mercy. If you had one word to describe verse 8, what would it be? We've looked at it a lot in this room. 
Long suffering. The glory of God. Oh. Right? Those are all the attributes of God that oh. we've listed in, in, in the glory of God. The Lord is good to all. His tender mercies are over all his works. All thy works shall praise thee, O Lord, and thy saints shall bless thee. There's the angels worshiping. They shall speak of the glory of thy kingdom and talk of thy power to make known to the sons of men his mighty acts and the glorious majesty of his kingdom. There you have the angels, the saints shall bless thee. They shall speak of the glory of thy kingdom and talk of thy power to make known to the sons of men. There you have the angels worshiping and then the angels ministering to, a to Israel to make known to the sons of men his mighty acts, the glory and majesty of his kingdom. You see how we just saw it, read that, right? The angels are ministering spirits. Mm -hmm. Okay. Verse 13, thy kingdom is what? An everlasting kingdom. Yeah. Thy dominion endureth throughout all generations. The Lord upholdeth all that fall, raise up all those that be bowed down. The eyes of all wait upon thee, and thou givest them meat in their due season. Thou openest thy hand and satisfy the desire of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and holy in all his works. The Lord is nigh unto all them that call upon him, to all that call upon him in truth kind of seems like some of those things we looked at last t last Thursday about the Lord's Prayer would fit with this passage, don't, doesn't they? He will fulfill the desire of them that fear him. He will also hear their cry and will save them. The Lord preserve all them that love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. My mouth shall speak the praise of the Lord, and let all flesh bless his holy name forever and ever. There's that more excellent name, and there's also his name being hallowed. That's that that issue of his his kingdom, he, he's got, his kingdom's going to last forever. Right. So when it when when Israel and the, the people that the Hebrews book of Hebrews is written to, when they're looking for that kingdom, the one that that um, Peter asked, "Are you now at this time going to again restore your kingdom to Israel?" They're expecting it to be that everlasting kingdom. Right. The first yeah. thousand years of the millennium kingdom, and then they're going to and then but. But there's no end for them. You know, it's not like there's a millennial kingdom and then something stops and we go on. It, that his kingdom starts and goes. There's, there's a, you know, there's some stuff that happens at the end of that thousand years, but the kingdom never stops. Right. It's an everlasting kingdom and it's ruled with righteousness, and they're going to be there with him. Don't forget, Hebrews is written to that group as they go through the tribulation. What's he setting up? Hope. Right. right. Hope. Hebrews, you know, the, the the last three and a half years of that tribulation is going to be terrible. They're going to be wanting to know. We're ready for this to be done. And he's going to start pointing them to that hope. So I really I want to go look at something that has to do with everlasting thing. And I'm going to show you guys something that maybe you know, maybe you don't know. Uh, but I always find it very fascinating when I go through it. Come with me, if you would, to Jeremiah 23. So there are some phrases in the Bible that key, that should key all of us, specifically though, Israel, the little flock, to some things. And what we're going to find out is why there's four Gospels. So I'm going to do this sitting up. I think you guys can see that. Okay. Okay. So look at uh, Jeremiah 23. In verse 5. I'm just looking at something here. Let's go, uh, let's just, verse 1, verse 1 actually. Woe be unto the pastors that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, mm. saith the Lord. He's talking about the Pharisees. I mean, the yeah. Pharisees aren't here, but the prophet, it's about the Pharisees as they destroyed, as they oh, killed leaders. Jesus. The shepherds killed, and the sheep the sheep are scattered, right? Okay. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God of Israel, against the pastors that feed my people, you have scattered my flock, driven them away, have not visited them, 
Behold, I will visit upon you the evil of your doing, saith the Lord. And I will gather what? The remnant yeah. of my flock. There's the, the issue. We talked about the little remnant and that little flock. I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all countries whither I have driven them, and will bring them again to their folds, and they shall be fruitful and increase. I will set up shepherds over them which shall feed them. There's the twelve apostles sitting on the twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. I will set up shepherds over them which shall feed them, and they shall fear no more, nor be dismayed. Neither shall they be lacking, saith the Lord. Why won't they be lacking? Because they're seeking first the kingdom of God. He's going to add everything to them. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper, and shall execute judgment and justice in all the er in, in the earth, you see, remember, we, he just talked about in Hebrews, God said unto the Son, thy kingdom. Yeah. This is that kingdom. You see, who is, I will raise unto David a righteous branch. That's the Lord Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. right? Okay. And again, these are going to be things that, that, that are, the writer of Hebrews is trying to trigger in this little flock. In his days, Judah shall be saved, mm -hmm. and Israel shall dwell safely. And this is his name, whereby he shall be called the Lord our righteousness therefore behold the days come saith the lord that they shall no more say the lord liveth which brought us brought up the children of israel out of the land of egypt but the lord liveth which brought up and which led the seed of the house of israel out of the north country and from all countries whither i have driven them and they shall dwell in their own land so right now it, it, people look at at, at, God, at israel and say that's the country that god brought out of, out of brought out of egypt and this time it's going to be not that's going to be the god that brought all the people out of all the countries into his kingdom and set his kingdom up right, right okay you can tell what we're talking about here is the when the when the kingdom gets set up what i want you to see though is this word you see the word behold and you see the word branch don't you right yeah. okay this one both this both behold jeremiah 23 is a behold statement and a branch statement that points Israel to their king. Okay. okay. Now, you see in verse six, it says, "And is his this is his name whereby he shall be called the Lord our righteousness." Mm -hmm. Okay. What I want you to do, if you would, come with me to Jeremiah thirty-three and verse sixteen. Jeremiah 33 and verse 15. In those days and at that time will I cause the branch of righteousness to grow up unto David. He shall execute judgment and righteousness in the land. You see the parallel to the other passage we just read. Uh -huh. In those days shall Judah be saved. Jerusalem shall dwell safely. And this is the name wherewith she shall be called the Lord our righteousness. You see what happened that just happened there? In the first in, in Isaiah twenty three it's Jesus that's called the Lord our righteousness. Right. And it's in all caps, so it's Jehovah. Again, there's another verse that calls Jesus Jehovah. God. Yeah. In I in, in Jeremiah thirty three, who is called the Lord our righteousness? Israel. Israel. They have the same name. In this day, when that kingdom gets set up, Israel and Jesus, their Messiah, they're, married and they they're going to have the same name. Uh -huh. Yeah. Now, what are we? We're the body to the head. We're the, but what are we? We're, we're, we're the body of Jesus. The body of Christ. Right. If we deny him, he cannot deny, he, he won't deny us. Why? He can't, deny, he can't himself. deny himself. You see, when somebody gets saved, gets declared righteous, whatever word you want to put on it, you are so securely held, so so securely a part of, of the program that you're in, that you are identified with the Lord Jesus Christ. Here they are by name. Mm -hmm. By the very name. Jesus is going to be called the Lord our righteousness. 
Israel's going to be called the Lord our righteousness. Isn't that something? Mm -hmm. We talked about our inheritance. What he inherit? What we are? What joint heirs with Christ? What he inherits, we inherit. What we inherit, he inherits. You see the depths of the love that Jesus and God the Father have for their creation. It's to me, it's just it's absolutely phenomenal. And, and I would footnote those two verses. So when you read one, you always read the other and see how in it, they're just completely together. They 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 can't be undone at that time in the kingdom. Now the reason they can't be undone, right, as we've as we've seen in the last few weeks we've been studying, is the uh, uh, Davidic covenant, the new covenant rather, where he says, "I will do it. I will put my heart, your, yeah. my judgments and statutes in their heart. I will cause them to walk in the way they should." Right. Okay, so. Again, what we're talking about, there's this issue. He's going to rule that kingdom. He's going to be called the Lord our righteousness. That's an everlasting kingdom. The little flock, when they're following with the writer of Hebrews, they're going to be able to understand that's the kingdom that we're part of, and we're going to be identified as part of that. Mm -hmm. Now, be clear, that verse does not talk about the Gentiles. Right. That verse talks about Israel by name. Right. Okay. Come with me, if you would, to Zechariah 3. Zechariah 3, and verse 8. Hear now, O Joshua the high priest, thou and thy fellows that sit before thee. For they are men wondered at. For behold, I will bring forth my servant, the branch. You see, you got the behold in the branch there, right? Uh -huh. Now, what I want you to see there is the branch is capitalized. It is. That's Jehovah. Right. That means he's talking about Jehovah. But what does he call Jehovah? A servant. A servant. Oh. So you got Zechariah 3. Is it 8? Zechariah 3, 8. Where he's identified with being a servant, right? Mm-hmm. But the behold statement also identifies him in that verse as God, too, doesn't it? Through the capitalization of that word. You, you Behold, I bring forth my servant, Jehovah. Right. Behold, I bring forth my servant, the branch. Look with me at Zechariah 6 and verse 12. You see the wonderful kind of richness oh, yeah. that's in the Old Testament? Yeah. Verse 12. And there'd be so much more if we would take the time and go back and, sp and study these books and these passages and not just grab one verse out, right? Verse 12. And speak unto him, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, Behold, the man whose name is the branch. He shall grow up out of his place and shall build the temple of the Lord. He shall build the temple of the Lord. He shall bear glory. He shall sit and rule upon his throne. He shall be a priest, huh, upon his throne. And the council of peace shall be between them both. It's interesting because the king couldn't be the priest. But here he says he will be. So here you have, behold what? The man. The man. Yeah. And again, he's called the branch. And both of these are capitalized. The word capitalized, meaning it's it's God. So one more, and look with me over at Isaiah 40. And all of these we've looked at, and this last one we're going to look at too, are all in relationship, or all in in relation to the to the kingdom being set up. They're verses of hope, if we can put it that way. 
Isaiah 40 and verse 9. O Zion, what that bringest good tidings, get thee up into the high mountain. O Jerusalem, that bringest good tidings, lift up thy voice with strength. Lift it up. Be not afraid. Say unto the cities of Judah, Behold your God. So here you have the behold statement. In the Old Testament, when you see when that word branch comes out, there are four times branch will identify king, servant, man, or God. There are four behold statements in the Old Testament that will talk about king, servant, man, or God. The king is presented in Matthew. The servant is presented in Mark. The man is presented in Luke. And God is presented in John. In John. Yeah. And that is why we have four Gospels. Because it's, it's not meant so you can take them and lay out a timeline and put together the life of Jesus. God could have done that. He did, right? We know he could have done it because he did it in the book of Acts, didn't he? Right. Laid out that timeline. If God had wanted us to have a time, and I'm not saying I'm not mad at somebody if they want to put together the timeline of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's very interesting to me. But that's not why we have four Gospels, so that we can pick, copy and paste them and come up with a timeline. It's so that uh, Israel understands as their, their, as their Messiah is presented as their king, the servant, the man, and God. And all four of those Gospels line up with all four and behold statements. And they line up with all four branch statements. <coughs> See, there's a doctrine being taught back there. And like I said earlier, it's amazing there's a richness in the Old Testament. Now, can we learn from this stuff? Oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. We can definitely learn. Absolutely. And again, if you go and read each one of these books, you know, Matthew, you got the genealogy, right? Right. right. And, and, he, but he, and, and where does it go back to? Generation David and Abraham, right? David the king. You go to Mark, and you get wore out. It's just, he does, he does, he does, he does, and he does, and he does. You can just see the servant in him. Luke, the doctor, presents the manhood, the humanity. And then John, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. These are the four things that the nation of Israel is to look for. Mm -hmm. That's why we have four Gospels. They've all been brought out. They're always, the, behold your king, behold the servant. Behold the man. Behold your God. It's fascinating. For me, it's fascinating. And he calls them all the branch. Somebody asked me the other day about the root of David. The root of David is the branch. Right, right. Mm, yeah. It's fat. To me, it's fascinating. Fascinating. So, that really didn't have anything to do with Hebrews other than the fact that I got to go to Jeremiah and talk about that kingdom. And I said, hey, you know what? That's a good time to do that. And, and to think about, don't let anybody come along and... and, and and take away the wonderfulness that is four gospels. You know, you can put them, you can put them on a timeline. That's fine, but don't miss the presentation that's being made, and that it lines up with some some items there in the Old Testament. Um, look with me over at Isaiah eleven. Isaiah 11 and verse 1. There shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots, and the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. There's the mind of Christ. You want to know what the mind of Christ is? It's described right there in, in verse 2. 
shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears. But with righteousness shall he judge the poor, and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. That rod of iron, you see, you see that issue there? He's going to smite the earth with the rod of his mouth. That rod of iron is the word of God proceeding out of his. Okay. And with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. And righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins. And faithfulness the girdle of his reins. And then it goes on to describe the kingdom. How wonderful the kingdom will be there. And I just want you to see. He, the writer of Hebrews is explaining to the people that are going to be reading this book that the man Jesus Christ was faithful. God resurrected him by inheritance, gave him a name above all other names, made him better than the angels, gave him a kingdom that's going to be forever lasting. He's going to rule it with righteousness. And the little flock's going to be able to go, hey, I remember we read about that back in Psalms. Okay. And we read about it in Isaiah. And we read about it in Jeremiah. And Moses talked about it. And they're going to understand. Because the only way they're going to be able to tell the difference between Jesus and the Antichrist is to compare what they see to the Word of God. Yeah, and they're going to right. have to believe the Word of God, not what they see. Because he's going to stand up in the in the temple. He's going to reinstitute the, the uh, sacrifices. He's going to stand up in the temple and say, "I am God," and they're going to, and, and they're going to want to believe him, because he's going to be have done. He's going to have brought somebody back from the dead. He's going to create everlasting, not everlasting. He's going to have created peace in the Middle East, probably worldwide. And he's going to be beautiful, and he's going to be wise and well spoken. And they're going to they're going to have to compare that to the Word of God. Right. And that's why this book is here. This, this, this book is here to tell the Hebrews what happened at that cross so that they know the man Jesus Christ, the man that was crucified, is God, is their Messiah, and he's going to reign that kingdom. And, and it would, in chapter 1, he's really trying to lay that groundwork. We already saw it. He already took us back and explained to that, explained the issue of creation, that he was the creator even. So come with me if you would. Keep a hand in Psalms and we'll go right back. But look at verse 10, 11, and 12 back here in Hebrews. Hebrews 1, verse 10. And thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thine hands. They shall perish, but thou remainest. They all shall wax old as doth a garment, and as the vesture shalt thou fold them up, and they shall be changed, but thou art the same, and thy ears shall thy ears, thy years shall not fail. Mm -hmm. Okay? This is Psalm one oh two. So come with me back to Psalm one oh two. Um, Psalm 102, just verse 1, um, and we don't read that much. Um, verse 12, verse 12. But thou, O Lord, shall endure forever, and I am a remembrance unto all generations. Thou shalt rise and have mercy upon Zion. For the time to favor her, yea, the set time has come. So he began to speak comfortably to the nation. For thy servants take pleasure in her stones, and favor the dust thereof. So the heathen shall fear the name of the Lord, and all the kings of the earth thy glory. You can see we're talking about the kingdom. That certainly isn't true today. When the Lord shall build up Zion, he shall appear in his glory. He will regard the prayer of the destitute, 
and not despise their prayer. This shall be written for the generation to come. And the people which shall be created shall praise the Lord. The people Hebrews is written to. We're going to see in just a minute that the writer of Hebrews quotes this passage. But when he says, this shall be written, he is exactly talking about the, the people that are the little flock that Hebrews is written to, okay? For he hath looked down from the height of his sanctuary, from heaven did the Lord behold the earth, to hear the groaning of the prisoner, to loose those that are appointed to death, to declare the name of the Lord in Zion and his praise in Jerusalem, when the people are gathered together and the kingdoms to serve the Lord. He weakened my strength in the way, he shortened my days. I said, O my God, take me not away in the midst of my days, Thy years are throughout all generations. Of old hast thou laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of thy hands. They shall perish, but thou shalt endure. Yea, all of them shall wax old like a garment, and a vesture shalt thou change them, and they shall be changed. But thou art the same, and thy years shall have no end. The children of thy servants shall continue, and their seed shall be established before thee. It's his kingdom. He set it up. He's going to last. That kingdom's going to last forever. He's going to last forever. And see that last part there? The children of thy servants shall continue, and their seed shall be established before thee. The nation's going to go forever with him as well. Mm -hmm. You see, the writer of Hebrews quotes this. He's going to want them to go back and read this thing, and so they can know what's going on, because it's going to be a destitute time. What we didn't read is. Like, look at verse 1. Hear my prayer, O Lord, and let my cry come unto thee. Hide not thy face from me in the day when I am in trouble. Mm -hmm. Incline thy ear into, into me in the day when I call, answer me speedily. For my days are consumed like smoke, and my bones are burned as an hearth. My heart is smitten and withered like grass, so I forget to eat my bread. Think about the deliver us, not into, uh -huh. uh, deliver us from temptation and uh, deliver us not into evil. I think I'm messing that up, but you know what I mean. These things mean some things to those people that are reading the book of Hebrews. So come, let's go ahead and go back to Hebrews and we'll finish the chapter. We'll be back in Psalm 2, so don't, <laughs> yeah. don't let that go. Verse 14. Verse 13. you see what he's saying there though in those last few verses their Messiah is going to set up that everlasting kingdom they're associated with that kingdom and as, as long as Jesus Christ rules in that that little flock's going to rule with them in that kingdom as well so it's to bring them hope verse 13 but to which of the angels said he at any time sit on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool which angel did he say that to he didn't say it to anybody did he no no Let's go look at that. That's Psalm 110. Psalm 110. The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. It's God the Father speaking to God the Son. Mm -hmm. The Lord shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion. Rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power. In the beauties of holiness from the womb of the morning, thou hast the dew of thy youth. The Lord hath sworn and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The Lord at thy right hand shall strike through kings in the day of his wrath. He shall judge among the heathen. He shall fill the places with dead bodies. He shall wound the heads over many countries. He shall drink of the brook in the way. Therefore shall he lift up the head. He's coming to restore Israel. Israel's, think about it. This is what Israel's going to exactly say. The Lord at thy right hand shall strike through the kings in the day of his wrath. Mm -hmm. Because right. 
they've surrounded Israel. They're treating Israel poorly, and he's going to come back and have his vengeance on the, na on the nations when he comes back to set up. And he never told an angel to do that. Who did he tell to do that? His son. Right. Their Messiah. Yeah, none of the angels. Their king. Behold, the branch that is called the king, the servant, the man, and God. Verse 14 back in Hebrews. We're coming back right, right back to Psalms, so don't let it go. Psalm 14. Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister to them who shall be heirs of salvation? In time past and in the ages to come, mm -hmm. the angels minister to Israel. Now, in the, but now, they don't. Right. The angels, they, they learn from us. They don't right. minister to us today. Um, I had a lot of things to go over with that, which we've been over before. So look, look at Psalm 103. Verse 20. Again, this issue of what is the role of the angels in Israel's program in time past and in the ages to come, which is what Hebrews is about. Uh, verse 20. Uh, verse 19. The Lord hath prepared his throne in the heavens, and his kingdom ruleth over all. He's got it prepared up right up there. He's going to bring it back down. When he does, bless the Lord, ye his angels that excel in strength, that do his commandments, hearkening unto the voice of his word. Bless ye the Lord, all he hosts, ye minister, ye ministers of his, that do his pleasure. Bless the Lord, all his works and all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O my soul. To the Son, he calls him God and says, you have a kingdom that's everlasting. To the angels, he calls them ministering spirits that just go out and do his pleasure. They do the work. Israel's going to rule and reign with the Lord Jesus Christ, not with the angels. That's not their hope. Their hope is not to have a position of authority equal to the angels. Their hope is to be ruling with their Messiah on the earth in that literal, earthly, Davidic kingdom sitting over there on a piece of ground in the Middle East. If you want... an uh, uh, in, in, in your own time, you can go read Luke 1, Luke 2, and you can see that issue of the angels ministering to the nation. Okay, because of the interest of time, and I want, I'd want i like to finish a chapter tonight. Well, we're not going to do that. But come with me, get Acts 12 and Acts 16, and you begin to see the program with angels change. Clearly, in the Old Testament and in the Gospels, angels came and ministered to the nation Israel. Acts 12 and Acts 16. Acts 12, verse 7. All I want to do is, all I want to look at is two different ways people get out of jail. It's all, all I'm interested in here. Acts 12, verse 7. Verse 6, when Herod would have brought him forth the same night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains, and the keepers before the door kept the prison. Pete's in jail. Behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him, and a, slight, a light shined in the prison, <laughs> and he smote Peter on his side and raised him up, saying, Arise up quickly, and his chains fell off from off his hands. And the angel said unto him, Gird thyself, and bind on thy sandals. And so he did, and he saith unto him, Cast thy garment about thee, and follow me. And he went out, right? And, and, and he leaves. So Peter gets out. How'd Peter get out? The angel. That angel did it, didn't he? Yeah. Come with me to Acts 16. In verse 25. And at midnight, Acts 16, 25. Uh, they're in jail. Verse 23, 24, they're in jail. And in verse 25. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. Suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. Immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's band were loosed. 
the keeper of the prison awakening out of his sleep and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. You guys see any angels? No. Not something. Mm -hmm. Nobody moved either. They didn't go out. Angels minister to the little flock. Right. And the angels got Peter out of prison. Angel. Yeah. They don't minister to the church of the body of Christ, and no angel shows up to get Paul out of prison. No. Come with me to Ephesians 1. And actually, Ephesians 3 is what I mean. What was that last? Um... Acts 16, 25. We're going to go to Acts 3. Ephesians 3. Ephesians 3, Ephesians 3, and 1 Corinthians 6, and we'll be done. So Ephesians 3 and verse 8. So this is where Paul's revealing the mystery. This is, the, this is really where you see the mystery revealed. Verse 8. Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. So there were some, some things you couldn't search out you couldn't go back in the Old Testament and find him. You couldn't figure it out. And now Paul's going to, he's going to preach those things. And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which been from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. To the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God, according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. What I want you to see is here in the dispensation of grace and in the, in, the, in the mystery program, the time that we would live in, the principalities and powers, of course, those are the angels. They're looking down at the church to see and understand the manifold wisdom of God. Mm -hmm. They're learning about God from the church. Before, Israel was learning about God and his plan from the angels, right? right, right. You see the difference? Yeah. Complete difference, right? Israel would take God's message, or the angels would take God's message and give them to Israel. Mm -hmm. The angels today are looking at the church of body of Christ, and when it operates properly, they understand the, the manifold, the different levels of God's wisdom, the manifold wisdom of God. Now it says, according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. What's the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord? Ephesians 1, 9, and 10 tells you yeah. to reconcile everything, whether it be heaven and earth, back in his, his son. son. He, they look down at the church of body of Christ, they understand now God's eternal purpose. They understand what's going to happen. And boy, some of them are thinking they made a bad decision. Because there doesn't appear to be any redemption for an angel. Come with me what I say. Second, 1 Corinthians 6. First Corinthians 6, verse 1. Dare any of you, having a matter against another, go to law before the unjust and not before the saints? Do ye not, do ye not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are ye unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Know ye not that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? When he says, do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? He's talking about the world of the angels there. But there's a time coming when we're going to judge the angels. You see that relationship for us with the angels is totally different than what it was for Israel. Right. And, and it's one of the things you've got, you got to be cautious about when you read the book of Hebrews is to understand that the things that the, the writer of Hebrews says about the angels in relationship to Israel don't apply to the church of body of Christ today. We see, you know, when we look at the book of Hebrews, you know, why do I bring up this when we're not, this is not what we're studying what Hebrews about? Because we're studying Hebrews dispensationally considered. We want to under, need to understand the differences. Yes, we're really, our focus is on what's going on with the little flock, but it's very important to understand the differences because there's some verses in Hebrews that can, you can lose your salvation. We're coming up yeah. on them real quick. Oh, yeah. And chapter one, you'll see here next week or the following week, 
chapter 1 lays the foundation for that. The issue is if Jesus is better than the angels, and which chapter 2 is going to start, well, if the angels gave the Ten Commandments, how, how, what are we going to do if we reject the salvation that Jesus Christ preached? Because yeah. Jesus Christ is better than the angels, and we rejected what the angels said. And that's a big issue for them to get straight. Okay? We're, we're really out of time. I'm gonna, Next week, I, I do want to... You guys want me to finish a chapter tonight? I need 10 minutes probably to finish a chapter. We can do it tonight or next week. It's up to you guys. We'll do, do it now. Okay. The last thing in, in Hebrew, this will take a few minutes. Hebrews 1, verse 14. I think the person that's most shocked, shocked is probably Bill O'Lean, because I took care of about 15 verses on Sunday, and we got about eight verses today, and I don't think Bill thinks I could do it. I I, somewhere, Bill, I'm sure Bill O'Lean lost a bet with somebody. <laughs> <laughs> verse 14. Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? That's a big issue you got to figure out. Who are the heirs of salvation that the writer of Hebrews is talking about? Now, we're far enough into this that you guys know I'm going to make the, the, the case that it's the little flock. Right. Because that's who the book of Hebrews is written to. It's not us. Look at Hebrews 6. Verse 10. For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which ye have showed toward his name, in that ye have ministered to the saints and do minister. And we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end. What's the end? The end is going to be the end of the tribulation, right. or as we saw earlier, what was called the end of the worlds in, in chapter 1. That ye be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit what? The promises. Promises, plural. Who were the promises made to? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, weren't they? We were made a promise. Titus is very clear, right? That we, we have the, God has made a promise of eternal life to us, singular. Look what he says. For when God made promise to Abraham, because he's, it's whereby no greater, he swear by himself, saying, "Surely, saying, surely, blessing I will bless thee, and multiplying I will, will yeah, uh, bless thee." We heard, yeah. So anyhow, the, the, what I want you to see here is in this, the people that are inheriting, the, the people that are the heirs of salvation are inheriting the promises because the the, pro, the the salvation, as we're going to see when we get to chapter two, is deliverance. Probably should have gone back and looked at those verses in Luke. Maybe we will next week. But we need to understand what the deliverance is. The deliverance for Israel is deliverance from their enemies. Right. And into the kingdom. It's not deliverance necessarily. It does involve deliverance from spending eternity in hell. But our, when we talk about our salvation, we're talking about not going to hell and because we get to go to heaven. For them, the salvation, the, the deliverance here is from their enemies and into the kingdom. Okay. Look with me, if you would, at 1 Peter 1. First Peter 1, verse 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. You see that issue of being begotten again? Yeah. 
Okay, when was the first time Israel? It was, it, you can tell it's the strangers scattered abroad. That's that's the nation of Israel. When was the first time they were begotten? When they came out of Egypt. To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Peter is talking about that they have an inheritance coming. That, that would be the heirs, right? And heirs receive an inheritance. And he's talking clearly to the scattered, to those that have been scattered abroad, there in the diaspora, but before they've been brought back. And he's making that argument. Does that make sense? So the obvious question is, well, why does it say that their heaven's reserved in heaven? Look at John 1. John 14, I'm sorry. John 14. John 14. The guy in TV that uses this verse totally destroys it. He shouldn't use it. John 14, verse 1. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. And where I am, there you may also be. What's he going to do? He's going to go to heaven. Why is he going to heaven? That's where the mansions are. That's where the that's where what he's prepared for them is. It, it's in it's in heaven. It's not going to stay there. He's going to bring it back. Look at Luke. Look at Luke nineteen. Luke 19 and verse 11. I'm looking for something real quick here. Okay. Luke 11 and verse... Luke, I'm sorry, 19, verse 11. And as they heard these things, he added and spake a parable because he was nigh to Jerusalem and because they thought that the kingdom of God should immediately appear. He said, therefore, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and what? Return. Jesus Christ goes to heaven where their treasures stored up, where he's preparing some things for them it's in heaven, and he's what? He's going to return. Mm -hmm. Is that our is, is our hope that Jesus that, that Jesus Christ is going to return and bring us something for to, to enjoy here on heaven? On earth? No. Uh, on earth? No. no. It's to be what? Meet him in the airs and for forever be with him in the air, isn't it? Right. Isn't it? So the, the heirs of salvation in Hebrews is the people that are heirs to the promises made to Abraham of a kingdom. That kingdom right now is being prepared in heaven. It's not going to stay there. It's going to come back. Mm -hmm. I said something a couple minutes ago, and, and I, I want to show you, that their salvation... It's not about going to heaven. For them, salvation is about going into the kingdom. Right. right okay? Yes. With that in mind, and then we, I promise we'll finish here. Look over at Mark 9. Mark 9, verse 43. If thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell into the fire that never shall be quenched, where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. So what's, what, what, what's the issue there? If you have a problem... Now, please don't, please don't cut anything off, okay? This is not to us, okay? I just want to be clear. Please don't cut anything off. His point is, if your hand's a problem, cut it off, because it's better to go into life, right? 
do it, everybody understands that's eternal life, right? Better to go into into life. You're, they're already living. I mean, they're all, go into life than go to hell. It's better to go into life with one hand than go into hell with two good hands. Right. Okay. So the, the issue there is eternal life. Okay. Mm -hmm. Verse forty-five: If thy foot offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter halt into life than having two feet to be cast into hell into the fire that never shall be quenched, where their worm dieth and the fire is not quenched. So again. He's talking about life. He's talking about life. Clearly, he has is the meaning there is eternal life, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Verse forty-seven: If I f I offend thee, pluck it out. It is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of whoa. Different. To enter into the kingdom of God with one eye wow. than having two eyes to be cast into hellfire, where their worm dieth not and their fire is not quenched. You see what's happening there? He's equating life, life with, the with the kingdom of God for them. Mm-hmm. Their, their hope, eternal life to them, does not mean going to heaven and ruling in the heavenly places. Eternal life for, for Israel was never about getting to heaven. It was about going into that kingdom that lasts forever. The heirs of salvation are expecting to go into an earthly, Davidic, real kingdom with New Jerusalem thrones on this planet Earth. That's who the heirs of salvation are. Mm-hmm. I want, to, I want to be clear that we understand that. And, and this is a good passage. It shows you when he's talking about life for them, for us, for, for them, he's talking about the going into the kingdom. Mm -hmm. Eternal life for us is what? Is it the kingdom? And it, 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 technically heaven, it is, yeah. yes. But it's not it, here on earth, is it? Right. It's in the heavenly places, right? Right. Repent be baptized for the kingdom of God is at hand. The issue, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The issue for them is that kingdom is there. It's, it's time. Okay. All right. We are done with Hebrews 1. We are going to go into Hebrews 2 now, and we're, he's going to start to make, make that argument. Okay. If Jesus is better than the angels, we better pay attention, because if we, if we turn back, if we don't pay attention, and, and we didn't follow what the angels said, and we don't follow what Jesus says, how, how are we going to recover from that? And he's going to start laying out the arguments. Okay. And this is where you got to be careful and make sure you don't apply it to yourself because you can lose you can lose salvation in Hebrews. Because if those people don't endure till the end, that is going to be the issue. If they don't endure to the end, they won't make it into the kingdom. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's a big difference. Yeah, okay. it is. Huge difference. Okay. Yeah. Dear Heavenly Father, we do once again thank you for your love and your grace. We thank you that you do have, we do have the book of Hebrews that we can learn about your, about your son, his, his, the great exalted name that he has, the great exalted place that he has, the fact that he is God. I, I don't think that's a question for anybody in this room. Um, I do thank you that, uh, for the things that we can learn and the richness that we can learn. And studying the book of Hebrews gives us this wonderful cause to go back and, and look at all, the, all, all these things that are in the, the Old Testament and maybe give us some clarity uh, and some understanding of why those things are written. Um, and we do thank you for the mystery program, the, the gospel of the grace of God, that we don't have to endure until the end. We simply have to put our faith in the shed blood of Jesus Christ, that he died for our sins, was buried, and rose again the third day. And you tell us if we believe that, that moment we receive eternal life, we get sealed with the Holy Spirit, and forever have a hope of an eternity spent in the heavenly places, ruling and reigning with your Son. We do thank you for the simplicity that that is. In your name, amen. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, there was a lot there. I know that. Yeah. and I'm, I probably went a little fast. Anybody have any questions or thoughts or concerns or think I'm nuts? <laughs> well, that's a given. <laughs> <laughs> that must have been Jenny. I'm make a note about that. <laughs> yeah, you bet. <laughs> that was really good. Very comprehensive. Oh, good. Thank you. Thank you. So... You know, I always encourage you guys, you know, read a couple of chapters ahead, at least this week, this next week, read Hebrews 2 a couple of times, it's not many verses, and, and just start to, you know, he starts off with therefore, figure out what the therefore is, right, is there for, right. and then in light of that, read chapter 2, and you go, wow, okay, I'm starting to, starting to get some things, and I, you know, I don't know about you guys, I love this, the, you know, just the richness that comes out, and, and, and start and again, when you when you do this kind of stuff, don't go back and just read the verses that are quoted. 
Read the passage. Right. You get right. Take advantage of the fullness of the richness of, of the Word of God when you're studying it. Yeah. You know, don't get in a hurry. So sometimes it's easy to get in a hurry, but it's such a rich, wonderful book. So, okay, I'm gonna say goodbye to Facebook, and we'll say goodbye to Zoom.